Thank you very much, Broadcasting. And I want to thank all the members of the uh, Senate Committee on Legislative Operations, all the presenters uh, for their patience. We have a bunch of committees running simultaneously today, and I appreciate everyone's everyone's patience. I uh, want to welcome everyone to this afternoon's meeting of the Senate Committee on Legislative Operations and Elections. Uh, we do have all members present. Uh, Secretary, if you please note, we do have a quorum. All members are present. Uh, a few quick housekeeping items. As uh, everyone knows, uh, currently a legislative building is closed due to the pandemic. As a result, all committee meetings are being held virtually, meaning committee members, staff, and presenters are participating either through the Zoom app or by telephone. As most of you are doing now, you may view committee meetings online through the legislature's streaming service or on the legislature's YouTube channel. As in previous sessions, all committee-related information is available on the Nevada Electronic Legislative Information System, or NELIS, which is accessible from the Nevada Legislature website. This session, uh, members of the public have three ways to submit public opinion and testimony. Each way is slightly different. Some become part of the public record and others are opinion shared uh, for legislators' information. You can provide testimony via telephone during committee meetings. You can submit written testimony uh, and you can use the, the legislature's opinion poll application. Uh, we've gone over these before, and information about how to do that is on uh, the Nevada Legislature website. Uh, additionally, if you have any questions, you can certainly uh, feel free to call either my office or the Committee on Legislative Operations and Elections. If uh, you want to send in written testimony, you can email that to following email address, senloe at send.state.nv.us. Again, that's senloe at sen.state.nv.us, or you can send it via fax machine to 775-684-6500, 775-684-6500. Just please, uh, we ask that you write the bill number that you are submitting written testimony on. Uh, today, we are hearing one measure, uh, proposed constitutional amendment, Senate Joint Resolution 7. However, before we open the hearing on Senate Joint Resolution 7, I'd like to turn it over to our committee policy analyst, Mr. Stewart. We have a brief work session. Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Um, we have today three bills on work session, um, and I hope you can hear me. Um, the first one is Senate Bill 51, and you recall that was from the, um, on behalf of the Division of Human Resources Management. Um, we heard it on March 11th, and it declares that it's the policy of this state um, that its employees do not engage in gender-based harassment and specifies that such harassment violates this policy and is a form of unlawful discrimination. The measure requires administrator of the and resources management of the Department of um, Administration to adopt and maintain a policy concerning sex and gender-based harassment and at least annually review that update um, as necessary or review that policy as necessary. SB 51 also creates the Sex or Gender-Based Harassment and Discrimination Investigation Unit within the Department or within the Division of Human Resources Management. And that unit shall assign or appoint an investigator to discreetly investigate a complaint alleging sex or gender-based harassment, prepare a written report of his or her findings, submit that report to the unit for transmission to the appointing authority. And then finally, SB 51 makes um, any information obtained by the investigator, the written report, and the written resolution of that complaint confidential unless ordered by the administrator or, or a court. Now that last part that I mentioned is the subject of um, an amendment. And after the hearing on SB 51, uh, representatives from the Open Government Coalition, as well as the Division of Human Resources Management discussed um, a compromise to some concerns that the coalition had expressed regarding confidentiality provisions that are set forth in subsection six of section five. Um, the proposed comp conceptual amendment is there in your work session document um, as submitted by um, the coalition and the division. Um, it would, from what I can tell, um, replace entirely subsection six of subsection um, five. Um, and it essentially um, uh, states that any information that reveals the identity of a complainant, the identity of a person alleged to have engaged in um, harassment or discrimination, or the identity of a witness that has obtained an investigator by the investigator um, that's contained in the written report of a complaint um, that is retained or contained in the written resolution um, of a complaint 
um, that is retained is considered confidential and must not be disclosed unless so ordered after the conclusion of the investigation um, or ordered by the administrator or his designee or a court of competent jurisdiction. Now, I know that Mr. Long, uh, Mr. Chair, if it's okay, I know that um, uh, Peter Long, the administrator of the Division of Human Resources Management, um, was involved in the discussions concerning this amendment, and he may be able to assist the committee with questions as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Director Stewart, and I definitely want to thank uh, Mr. Long and uh, Administrator Freed for working with the Open Government Co Coalition. I believe that this amendment is a consensus amendment uh, to address their concerns and and the agency's concerns. And members, if there are any questions, we are very lucky to have Mr. Long here. If there are any questions about the amendment or about the bill, if not, I would accept a motion. Uh, Senator Sievers, cancer. Um, thank you, Chair Ornshaw. So I'm. Um, so the information is confidential unless the administrator or a court or or their his or her designee. So the administrator can actually designate it as not being confidential, not just a court. And Mr. Long, may I turn that over to you? Through you, Mr. Chair, to, to uh, Senator Ganser, that, that is correct. Um, uh, after a determination that the interest in disclosure outweighs the interest in confidentiality, and we would discuss that with our with our DAG before before I did that. So the original language was it was it was just confidential, and now it's because it, it seems like if there was a court order, you could release that information. I guess I'm a little bit concerned that the administrator has discretion um, because I. Maybe I need, maybe legal can help me with this because I would assume that um, any complaints that are filed, personnel type complaints that are filed, um, are confidential in general. Unless a court orders it. So I don't know whether the administrator should, should have that authority or not. And again, I'm certainly, as I understand it, this was. This is a consensus with the representatives of the agencies and the Open Government Coalition, but certainly I understand uh, your concern, Senator Sievers Gansert. Um, you know, I'm happy to, oh, excuse me, pardon me one second. I would like to, um, we're having a little bit of a technical issue. I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Fernley, our legislative counsel, but I think we'll have to be at ease for just a minute. I think he's having a little bit of a technical issue. So members, we'd be at ease and hopefully that can get fixed. And In broadcasting, I wonder if there's any way to, it seems like our, our legislative council, we're having a little bit of a technical issue. I don't know if broadcasting, if you can help them, I sure appreciate it, but if not, it might just have to be at ease until we can resolve that. Absolutely, Chair, we'll do our best. If you could just thank give you. a couple of moments, we, we certainly will. Thank you, broadcasting, and thank you members for your patience.
members, I am getting a message that we uh, we are uh, might need about a five minute recess to try to get the the technical problems fixed. And Senator Sievers, answer. Could I ask you before we go on recess just to restate your question, and hopefully then we can get an answer when we come back. Um, th thank you, Chair Ardshaw. When I'm looking at the conceptual amendment, it, it actually provides discretion to the administrator or his or her designee as far as whether information is to be kept confidential. Um, and I was thinking in most personnel cases, that information is confidential unless a court requires it. And in this amendment, it basically is weighing uh, the interest in uh, the interest in disclosure outweighs the interest in confidentiality. But I, I, I know if there was an individual who had a sexual harassment claim or gender-based claim, they may never want to be revealed. They are gonna want it investigated, but they may never want it revealed. And in most personnel cases, that's my question. Um, it seems like that type of information is held confidential. You know, under what circumstances does, does an administrator or someone other than a court um, have the ability to make that type of information um, public? I appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Ganser, for stating your question. And um, I don't know, Ms. Mr. Long, do you care to comment on that or would you rather we wait for our legislative council to uh, log back in? Peter Long, for the record, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would just point out that um, uh, in the original, original version, it had this verbiage for the administrator to be able to reveal that. But um, <clears throat> In the, in the conceptual amendment, um, it, it's specific to um, unless the person is an elected official. So it, it, it's very narrowly focused. So, so Chair Arntral, my question still goes back to, to legal and whether that type of information should remain confidential unless a court orders or you know someone with jurisdiction versus um, the discretion of, in this case, it's our administrator, but I'm thinking about um, businesses in general that I believe that type of information has to remain confidential. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sievers Ganser. Then I think we, I don't see our legislative council back in there yet. So I think we'll have to take just a brief recess. Thank you everyone for your patience.
Chair, you are unmuted and may re-begin. Thank you very much, committee, for your patience, and thank you, broadcasting, for uh, solving our technical difficulties. We'll bring the committee back to order. Uh, Mr. Fernley, Senator Sieber Scansard had a question about the language in the proposed amendment. Correct, and, and I apologize for the, the technical difficulties. Um, my understanding of the question is that, um, is whether the, the information uh, would only be able to be released upon a court order. Um, and, and I think what is going on with this uh, provision is that these are, um, these are records or documents that are in the custody of a, of a, of a state agency. So they would be public records unless the legislature declared them to be confidential. So what this is doing is the legislature declaring these records to be confidential in certain circumstances. Um, and, and the legislature certainly has that authority to, to, um, to, to, to enact laws that, that make records confidential. Um, so, so under this amendment, the, the, the records would be confidential if determined by the administrator when applying the standard um, in the amendment or um, unless a court released them. So either of those could occur. Uh, Chair Ornshell, if I can follow up. Please go ahead, Senator Super Scanser. So I was really kind of asking just in general. So I understand what you're saying, that the legislature can, with public records, can deem them confidential not, or to be held confidential or not or have provide discretion. But in the private sector, I thought personnel records were confidential, period. So is, is that not accurate? Um, I, I guess I would say I'm not I'm not familiar with that um, in the in the private sector. In the private sector, I'm uh, I mean they wouldn't be subject to any kind of public records law. Um, so I, I, I would I would guess that the uh, the private business um, could choose to keep those confidential. Um, I'm not aware of anything that would require them to be kept confidential, um, but they wouldn't be subject to any kind of public records law. So they, they could keep them confidential if there was. Um, uh, they felt the need to do that, and but they would be subject to you know subpoenas or court orders for their release. Um, Please go ahead if you have a follow-up, Senator Super Scanser. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you. you know that that's all uh, I'll ask for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice Chair Lang. Okay, I have a couple questions. Um, in the hearing, we talked about, um, I'm gonna look at the um, the first version we got. So it's um, in the training on page three. So it'd be section three um, C, which is on line three. And there were training requirements. And I thought we talked something about, I mean, it's all good to put something in that you're going to have training, but if there's no teeth to it, then it's not really, I don't feel comfortable. I mean, how do we know it's going to happen? Um, how do we know what it's about? Um, I, it says training requirements for managerial supervisory employees concerning equal employment opportunity. So I, I wish that um, there was some kind of language in there that told us when it was going to happen, or maybe it's annually or biannually, or, you know, I don't know. So that's just one comment and question I have. And then the second one is on the same page in line 19. And uh, there we talk, it says the appointing authority shall promptly notify the sex and gender-based harassment and discrimination investigation unit. Um, it doesn't say, it says promptly, but what is promptly? Um, and so I feel more comfortable if we had something in there 24 hours or something like that. Thank you very much, Vice Chair Ling. I think, Mr. <laughs> do you care to, to feel that question? As to how, you know, I'd be happy the bill time. passes as is, how the state would handle this? Peter Long, for the record, um, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, currently in regulations, <clears throat> there are requirements for training and classes concerning sexual harassment discrimination, and that's all new employees within six months must okay. take that training. Thank and you. then supervisors and managers also must take their, their portion of that training within six months after appointment as a supervisor or manager. And do they have refreshers? Absolutely, it's required. Oh. 
Good. Okay. And then in the appointing authority on line 19, there's no, it says that they should be uh, promptly notified. And what does promptly mean? That's a good question. No definition. <laughs> um, but we would expect them to promptly as soon as they become aware and reasonable. So, you know, as you said, 24 hours, that would, that would be not, that would not be unreasonable, but it could be a Friday where it's a weekend and they can't right. notify us until a Monday or something. But I would say reasonable would be within a couple of days of them being aware of the complaint. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Long. Uh, members, are there any additional questions? Majority Leader Canizaro. Thank you, um, Chair Orenshaw. I think I had a question. I one, I um, I think I share some of the same questions and and concerns as Senator Sievers answered on the administrator piece of this. It makes sense to me for a court to make a determination after we've declared something to be confidential, and especially in the instances of sex discrimination, because I do think one of the reasons why it is. Um, underreported, and one of the reasons why we've seen so much in the, in the Me Too movement is because coming forward with that can often, um, in a public way, can often result in uh, retaliatory actions or different um, perceptions of that particular worker that they just complain too much or that it's not an issue, and especially in instances where potentially an investigation doesn't, um, doesn't find a violation or, or even in instances where it does. Um, so I, I just am very cognizant of some of the implications of not having um, of that nature be confidential, um, unless in certain circumstances, which I think allowing that determination in the interest of disclosure outweighing the interest in confidentiality makes sense. Um, I also think, though, that I share some of the concerns about the administrator also having that ability. Um, the one question I did want to ask in addition was on this last line that says the section is not subject to NRS 288-505, which deals with the subjects of collective bargaining and wondering the purpose of that language. Uh, Peter Long, for the record, to you, Mr. Chair, to the Senator. Um, the purpose of that language is so that in a collective bargaining agreement, they, they could not contract out, not that they would, but they, so it's clear that they could not contract out of this confidentiality requirement. Okay, so that is meant for the confidentiality piece that that can't be abridged. If we deem something confidential, then they couldn't contract around that piece. Correct, Peter Long for the record, because currently 288, and NSB 135, uh, the, the, the bill that created collective bargaining for state employees, uh, allows the contracts to uh, not not to have to adhere to NRS 284 or 281. Um, and I know that section of NRS uh, deals with where there's conflict of laws with um, Uh, I just wanted to be clear, and that makes sense to me. You can't contract out of the confidential confidentiality piece, um, and if it's limited to that, then I think that makes some sense to me. Thank you, and members. I do. I think we've just been joined by um, Attorney Maggie McCletchy, who uh, is with the Open Government Co, and she might be able to uh, provide some other answers. She was involved with Mr. Long in negotiating this consensus amendment. And Ms. McCletchy, we've had some questions concerning the confidentiality in the proposed amendment. I wonder if you could kind of walk us through that. Sure. Good afternoon, for the record. Maggie McCletchy from the Nevada Open Government Coalition. And I was pleased to be able to resolve the coalition's concerns regarding, co regarding confidentiality so that we could balance the need to protect complainants, for example, with the need for the public to have access to information uh, for example, there's a high-profile investigation into Governor Cuomo's conduct in New York right now, and as originally drafted, the language would have uh, would have shielded that information from public view. Similarly, in uh, a few years ago, there was a trustee, not a state employee, but it's still relevant to the to the reason 
for the need for transparency. There was a trustee, uh, Kevin Child, who was engaged in alleged sexual harassment and other inappropriate conduct. And getting access to that information was vitally important for the public because CCSD took the position they could not control him. And because the voters could, the public needed access to information. CCSD resisted access. And ultimately, the Nevada Supreme Court, consistent with how this language is crafted uh, in the amendment, balanced the need of the public with the right, the privacy rights of of victims and witnesses to come forward. I think that the language here strikes a good balance between allowing an investigation to proceed protecting complainants while still allowing the public access to information. And I'm happy to answer any specific questions and I apologize I missed the earlier discussion. Members, are there any additional questions for Ms. McCletchy of the Open Government Coalition? I know she was very involved with Mr. Long and Administrator Freed on trying to negotiate this consensus amendment. Senator Sievers Ganser. Um, thank you, Chair Ormshaw. And and so I think the majority leader said it very well is I'm concerned mostly about the victim. So you've kind of told talked about the other side of the equation. So the, the folks who are the, the offenders, um, which I can see the need for some disclosure on that so that there's not other people who are affected. Um, but this amendment doesn't really talk about that. And, and again, my concern is that individuals won't come forward because they're afraid of retaliation. They're also potentially afraid to, to be publicly embarrassed or harassed um, if they do bring forward an allegation. And so I don't know if this, this language is clear enough to make sure that potential victims are, are protected. In my view, in, again, this is Maggie McCutchey for the record. In my view, it does. It specifically protects complainants and victims, not just their names, but other identifying issue issues, uh, other identifying information concerning the concerning victims and complainants, witnesses. Uh, so I, I believe that it does. We made that broader than just than just identity. Uh, the proposed amendment language protects the uh, identifying information of complainants that go forward, uh, as well as the as well as witnesses and the potential targets. And it does not allow release of any identifying information. Uh, it does not allow release of any identifying information um, um, until the investigation is over and only if a court, uh, the court determines that the public interest in disclosure outweighs the interest in confidentiality, um, which, which is exactly the balancing test that we already have in common law through the Nevada Supreme Court's decision in the CCSD case in which they upheld disclosure, but did direct the trial court judge to ensure that uh, that he was appropriately considering not just the privacy rights of potential uh, victims, but also potential complainants. And so this was crafted. Um, I, I wear a few hats as a lawyer. Uh, in addition to being a transparency advocate and a media lawyer, I also do happen to represent plaintiffs uh, in sexual harassment cases and victims of sexual assault. Um, and in that capacity, I do understand and respect the need to protect Victims and witnesses that come forward. This this ensures that the that the identity the identity is protected. Uh, the, the identity is protected. Um, thank you for your response. And when, when you just described um, what you just outlined, you talked about the court specifically, but not the administrator. And I guess I'm not concerned about the court and the court weighing and balancing. But this the way that I read this, it has discretion for the administrator. So is that not accurate? It does allow for discretion for the administrator, but the administrator needs to apply this needs to apply this kind this kind of balancing as well, and needs to carefully balance the concerns uh, the concerns that are at hand when you're protecting the identities of complainants and victims with the need for closure. So the director still needs to do that. In my experience, government agencies are are very protective of personal information. If anything, they're, they're often more protective than necessary and sometimes even protect information that's out in the public domain. Um, for example, that would be an instance in which the interest in disclosure of the information, if this information, if related information was already out in the public and someone wanted to correct the record and get access to the underlying 
uh, if documents with the identity revealed, um, that might be that might be appropriate because there there's not a great interest in in privacy if a victim has already a victim or a witness has already come forward, um, or say there's been a court case about that that witness uh, and that information is already out there. So yes, the director can release this information after the close of the investigation, but only if the director engages in the same type of balancing test that a court would need to engage in. Thank you, Ms. McCletchy. Under uh, Sievers Cancer, any further questions? No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, any additional questions? All right, I'm not seeing any additional questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Long and Ms. McCletchy for uh, answering questions about the amendment. Thank you for working uh, so uh, hard to reach consensus on this amendment so that make sure that the bill provides for transparency, uh, but also accomplishes the goals the state seeking to accomplish. So with that being said, uh, is there a motion to amend and do pass Senate Bill 51 with the amendment listed in the work session document? So moved. I have a motion from Vice Chair Lang. Is there a second? <clears throat> um, I'll, I'll second it, Chair. Thank you. I have a second from Majority Leader Canizaro. Is there any discussion on the motion? Uh, thank you, Chair Martel. So I'm going to vote. I'm going to support this because I do think that we need to make sure that um, we prohibit these types of actions. But I just want to reserve my right in case we need to amend this or make any um, modifications uh, to, 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 as far as the confidentiality piece. Thank you. Thank you. Majority Leader Canizaro. Um, thank you, Chair Ornshaw, and I, um, I, I am uh, I going to also vote yes on this um, with reservation. I think there's just some additional conversation and, and maybe some modifications. I think I'm along with uh, Senator Sievers Ganser on this piece. Thank you very much. Um, any other comments, members? Right. Uh, Secretary, would you uh, please uh, take a roll call vote? Senator Canazaro. Yes. Senator Severs Gansert. Yes. Senator Lang. Yes. Senator Buck. Yes. Chair Orenshaw. Yes. Thank you, Secretary, and I'll assign that floor statement. Uh, I'll take that floor statement. Uh, Director Stewart. Thank you, committee members. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, again, for the record, Michael Stewart, committee policy analyst. Our next bill on work session is Senate Bill 268. You recall that that was brought to us by Senator Harris. And we heard it on March 25th. Um, it would qu require the fiscal analysis division of the Le Legislative Council Bureau to the extent that resources are available to perform a budget stress test in each even numbered year. And that stress test would be designed to compare the estimated future revenue to and the estimated future expenditures from major funds in the state treasury under various potential economic conditions. Um, and then a report um, is required um, uh, showing the results of that test and that report must be posted on the legislature's website and also submitted to the governor and the legislature. And there are no amendments um, for consideration at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And I know that Senator Harris worked very hard on this measure. And I believe, uh, you know, we did have testimony uh, as to, from the Fiscal Analysis Division about the ability to perform this. Uh, members, um, are there any questions regarding Senate Bill 268? If not, I'd open it up for a motion. I move to do pass. I have a motion from Senator Sievers Ganser. Is there a second? Second. Second from Majority Leader Canizaro. Any discussion on the motion? Secretary, if you'd please take a roll call vote. Senator Canazaro. Yes. Senator Severs Gansert. Yes. Senator Lang. Yes. Senator Buck. Yes. Chair Orenshaw. Yes. 
Thank you, Secretary. And I'll assign the floor statement to Senator Harris. And uh, Vice Chair Lang, if you'd be back up in case for any reason Senator Harris can't be present on the floor that day. But Mr. Stewart, I believe one item left on the work session. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, for the record, Michael Stewart. Um, the last bill on work session today is uh, Senate Bill 292. Um, as you recall, it was brought to us by our Vice Chair, um, Senator Lang. Uh, it requires um, ballots for general election to permit the voter to vote a straight ticket for all candidates in one political party in, in those partisan races. Um, it does require a voter education program uh, to be provided by the county to include information um, regarding straight ticket voting. Um, the measure also addresses um, uh, minor party ballot access. Uh, it increases the number of signatures required for minor party ballot access from 1% to 2% of the total number of votes cast for representative Congress at the last general election. Um, and it also um, notes that those signatures must be apportioned equally among the petition districts. Uh, the bill adjusts um, the, the date of those petitions um, when they must be filed um, to June 1st and as well as a subsequent um, challenge date regarding minor party ballot access petitions. Senate Bill 293 also makes various changes regarding the filling of vacancies um, in elective office. Um, I would note that for the vacancy for U.S. Senator, SB 292 would require the governor to appoint a person who is of the same political party as the former senator. Regarding vacancies for representative in Congress, um, a candidate for a major political party must be nominated in a special primary election before the special general election. And then for vacancies um, regarding the office of legislator, SB 292 requires that a majority, the majority leader or the minority leader of the house of which the former legislator was a member um, and who is of the same party as the former legislator to submit uh, to the board of county commissioners a list of qualified nominees to fill that vacancy. And then finally, SB 292 uh, repeals provisions in Title 24 uh, that set forth various requirements um, concerning the internal um, organization and procedures of major political parties. Um, and I can certainly go through the amendment, Mr. Chair, unless the Vice Chair would like to, um, but I've got it listed here. Well, I, I see that we, we have our Vice Chair Lang, Senator Lang. We also have Mr. Schrager. Uh, members, are there any questions regarding the amendment? And I believe there is a proposed mock-up, which is on Nellis, for members to go through a, a mock-up of the amendment. Senator Orenshaw? Yes, Vice Chair Lang. If it's okay with you, I'll just quickly go through the amendments. Thank you, Vice Chair. Okay. Thank you. Um, so since the hearing and listening to the comment, from people, uh, I have changed the percent for minor candidates to qualify back to 1%. Additionally, uh, Senator Singer's answer, I made a change on how we fill legislative seats, giving the county commission the right to reject a list of names and given to them and then having a new list provided, they could do that one time. So, um, and then the other change is on, um, came from the county clerks. And that is on page five of the amendment, where it would go through the Secretary of State um, to get approval from the Secretary of State and the State Board of Examiners to get money if you were to have a primary uh, from the statutory contingency account. And um, while this is in here, I just want to remind people the last time we had an election like this was in 2011. And before that, I think it was like 40 years ago. So it's not like it happens often, but I think it's important to have that language in there because it is expensive for a county to do an election. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Vice Chair Lang. Thank you for <laughs> all the stakeholders and for walking us through the amendment. Uh, members, any questions on Senate Bill 292 and the proposed amendment and the mock-up? If not, I would open it up for a motion to amend and do pass with the mock-up that's currently on Nellis. Uh, so moved, Chair Ornshaw. I have a motion for Majority Leader Canizaro. Is there a second? And Vice Chair Lang, I think you're still muted. I think... I'm sorry, I will second the motion, Chair. Thank you, I have a motion and a second for, to amend and do pass. Any <laughs> second? Senator Sievers, cancer. Um, thank, thank you, Chair Orenshaw. So, so first I wanna thank the sponsor for the amendments that she's made. I, I think um, keeping the threshold at 1% for the minor parties makes sense. We wanna make sure that they can participate. 
I also appreciate the, the language that you put in there that county commissioners can reject a, a nominee. I, I really thought that maybe they sh there should be more than one person as far as a nominee, so it would be two or more. But, but anyway, I appreciate the amendment you made there. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna be opposed to the bill. And Nevada's a small state, and we're a state where our constituents know us. And when we get together as, as members of this body, we work very well, and I look forward to working across the aisle with, with um, my, my fellow colleagues. And in, in my mind, when you have a partisan straight ticket ballot, um, we're setting up a culture that's more like Washington, D.C., where people are looking at partisanship versus policy and who that individual is. And I really appreciate the culture that we have in Nevada here, where we do work across the aisle, where our, our voters who are very independent um, know us. They personally know us very frequently and they can distinguish you know, down the ballot who they want to vote for. And my concern is, again, just sort of setting this culture up of where Nevadans will look towards partisan, partisanship first and not policy and not the individual. I, I do recognize that you can check the partisan uh, uh, box at the top and then you can go down and select people. But you know, I trust the voters and that they will stay informed and that they can um, select who they want to represent them and I don't want us to move towards D.C. and the hyper-partisanship that we see there. I want us to work on policy. I want us to work across the aisle. I want our voters to know us. And um, I think the last election showed that we do have voters that are involved, and, and, I, and I trust them. And, I, you know, again, just checking a box at the top, um, it's been, it sounded like, according to some of the testimony, that we've had that, or that's existed in other states, and they've repealed it for, for um, a variety of reasons, I'm sure. So that's why I'm gonna vote no is because, um, again, we don't have a hyper-partisan culture in Nevada right now, and I don't want us to go any further down that road. I, I want us to continue to be independent and have a strong relationship with our constituents, as well as um, looking forward to working across the aisle with my colleagues of the, uh, the other party, the opposing party, thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Sieber Scansert. Uh, any additional discussion? And, uh, and I too, I, I appreciate your working with all the stakeholders. I appreciate your working with the minor parties, Vice Chair Lang. And one of the questions I had during the hearing, I, I really like how this, you know, this change would apply to anyone. A nonpartisan voter could, could uh, choose to vote however they wanted to, if they chose to, yet still have that freedom to vote for individual offices. So thank you for working so hard on this. Secretary, uh, roll call vote on Senate Bill 292, amend and do pass. Senator Canazaro. Yes. Senator Severs Gansert. No. Senator Lang. Yes. Senator Buck. No. Chair Orenshaw. Yes, thank you, Secretary. Uh, Senate Bill 292 does pass, and I will assign that full statement to my shirt. That brings us to the end of our work session, and uh, I want to thank our presenters for their patience. We will now open the hearing to the Joint Resolution 7. I still have uh, Senator Don Darrell Loop here. Uh, we might need to be at ease for a minute just to make sure all the presenters are ready, but I believe we've got um, our presenters for Senate Joint Resolution 7. Good afternoon or good evening, Senator Dondera Loop. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Chair and Shaw. I'd like to open the hearing on Senate Joint, Joint Resolution 7. We know you're busy back, going back and forth between different committees and presentations, so thank you for making time to present the bill today. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you, Chair Arnshaw and committee members. For the record, I am Marilyn Dondero Loop, representing Senate District 8 in Clark County. I am pleased to be joined today by Assemblyman Tom Roberts, representing Assembly District 3. We are presenting Senate Joint Resolution 7, the Nevada Higher Education Reform, Accountability, and Oversight Amendment which relates to the governance of the, of the University of Nevada system. I am sure many of you are aware of the general contents of the bill. I will start with some introductory comments and Mr. Roberts will provide additional comments after me. 
When Assemblyman Roberts concludes, we will also have Ms. Maureen Schaefer and Mr. Warren Hardy ready to present. As you know, the Nevada Constitution requires the legislature to provide for the establishment of a state university that is controlled by an elected board of regents whose duties are prescribed by law. Additionally, the Nevada Constitution provides for the Board of Regents to control and manage the affairs and funds of the state university under regulations established by law. Senate Joint Resolution 7 proposes to remove the constitutional provisions governing elections and duties of the Board of Regents and its control and management of the affairs and funds of the state university. Instead, SJR 7 would require the legislature to provide by law for the governance of the state university. I want to stress that SJR 7 does not repeat, does not repeal any existing statutory provisions governing the Board of Regents, including those that provide for the election of board members. However, it would make the board a statutory body whose structure, membership, powers, and duties are governed by those existing statutory provisions, subject to any statutory changes made through the legislative process. This is no different than so many other boards set forth in the Nevada revised statutes. In the lead up to previous sessions, there has been some misrepresentation as well as much misinformation provided to policymakers, included, including the Nevada legislature. Obviously, this is unacceptable. Assemblyman Roberts and I are encouraged by steps taken in recent years to correct many of these issues. Even so, as policymakers, we must be focused on building long-standing and stable systems of governance, not on individual personalities. We owe the citizens of Nevada a culture of accountability in all levels of government. This higher education system belongs to all Nevadans. It is our collective investment in the future of our state. As you recall, Assembly Joint Resolution 5 of the 79th session, which proposed some of the same amendments as that are in SJR 7, passed overwhelmingly in two legislative sessions, and we are grateful for the support of our colleagues. Senate Joint Resolution 7 removes the Board of Regents from the Nevada Constitution but does not substantially, substan, substantively change any higher education policy or procedure. It simply puts the Board of Regents and the Nevada system of higher education on par with every other governing board and state agency created pursuant to statute. Chapter 396 of NRS would continue to exist and would still comprehensively govern the Board of Regents, and it still includes the requirement that the board be elected. The purpose of SJR 7 is twofold. One, it allows the legislature to exercise informed and measured governance of ENCHI. And two, it allows more flexibility in considering reform proposals. Constitutional governance serves as an antiquated way to oversee higher education. The only reason the Board of Regents was placed in the Nevada Constitution in the first place was to access land grant funding under the Morrell Land Grant Act of 1862 without requiring action by the legislature. Ever since, we have included all the state's higher education governance and administration under this provision. Despite a laundry list of studies and analysis recommending the reorganization of the state's higher education structure. It is our belief with the passage of SJR 7, we will see a resurgence of strong support for the Nevada system of higher education and the Board of Regents. Mr. Roberts and I pledge our support to work with the NCU administration and the board on behalf of the students, their families, and our communities to have the best system in the nation. Chair Orenshaw and committee members this concludes my testimony, and I would like to turn over the microphone to Assemblyman Roberts, who will provide further information about SJR 7. 
Thank you very much, Senator Dondero Loop. Assemblyman Roberts, thank you for joining us today. Hi, thank you, uh, Chair Orenshaw, and thank you, Senator Don Darrell Loop and uh, distinguished committee members. Uh, for the record, I'm Assemblyman Tom Roberts, representing Assembly District 13 in Clark County. I'm pleased to join Senator Don Darrell Loop in my support for SJR 7. I'd like to point out, as set forth in the ballot question arguments for AJR 5 in the 2017 legislative session, that also, that although that some other states have elected boards with constitutional status that control and manage particular institutions and programs of public higher education. Nevada is the only state in which a single elected board with constitutional status controls and manages the affairs and funds of the state's entire system of public higher education. In the past cases before the Nevada Supreme Court, the Board of Regents has, has even asserted that its unique constitutional status gives it virtual autonomy and thus immunity from certain laws and policies enacted by the legislature. Based on legislative testimony, these assertions have given some people the impression that the board conducts itself as a fourth branch of government, and that the board too often invokes its constitutional status as a shield against additional legislative oversight and accountability. Again, as Senator Dondera Loop noted, things have improved in recent years. Nonetheless, this general government structure uh, needs to be changed. A good example of uh, this is how the university's budget is administered. While the Nevada Constitution requires the legislature to provide financial support for the operation of our universities, it also directs the board to control and manage the funds of the state university. This divide between the legislature's constitutional power to fund higher education and the board's constitutional power to direct how these funds are actually spent gives the board virtually unparalleled power within state government to control and manage higher education spending with the same level of legislative oversight typically applied to other, excuse me, without the same level of legislative oversight typically applied to other uh, executive branches of the agencies. Another component of SJR 7 relates to the administration of federal land grant proceeds that are dedicated for the benefit of state university. As a bit of background, the Nevada Constitution provides that funding derived by the state of Nevada under the Moral Land 1862, must be invested in a separate fund and dedicated for the benefit of certain departments of the state university. If any, any amount of the separate fund is lost or misappropriated through neglect or any other reason, the state of Nevada must replace the loss or misappropriated amount so that the principle of the fund remains undiminished. Senate Joint Resolution 7 clarifies and modernizes existing provisions of the Nevada Constitution relating to the administration of these federal land grant proceeds. However, because the state of Nevada must administer those proceeds in a manner required by federal law, SJR 7 will not change the purpose or the use of these proceeds. In closing, Senator Dodaro Loop and I know that SJR 7 represents a second bite at the apple, if you will. This time, however, the language in SJR 7 is softened from AJR 5 and now calls for governments rather than control and management of the state university. Moreover, a biannual legislative audit of the state university and other public institutions of higher education established by the legislature is also included in SJR 7. This new gentler language in the audit provision will bring an enhanced level of transparency and trust that our system of higher education so desperately needs. With that, Chair Orenshaw and members of the committee, this concludes our presentation. As noted before, we'd love to uh, pass this on to Ms. Maureen Schaefer to address SJR 7 and then Mr. Warren Hardy. I hope that uh, you consider uh, supporting this SJR 7 and we look forward to seeing it on the ballot in 2024. And Mr. Chair, if I may, they need a quorum in my committee in the assembly and I feel comfortable with the other three presenters and answering questions. So if, if, if I'm okay to leave, I would certainly uh, request your permission. Certainly, thank you so much, Assemblyman. Ms. Schaefer, uh, thank you for being here. Thanks for your patience tonight. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Maureen Schaefer and I am the Executive Director of the Council for a Better Nevada. We are a community organization comprised of labor, business, and philanthropic leaders whose purpose is to impact progress on issues that will increase the quality of life for all Nevadans. 
We want to thank Senator Dondero Loop and Assemblyman Roberts for bringing forward SJR 7 and testifying in strong support of the opportunity this bill presents for greater accountability, transparency, and oversight of the Nevada system of higher education, a system that carries with it a $1 billion biennial budget in taxpayer dollars and the operation of the seven institutions and the corporate NG office within it. Today, those seven community colleges, colleges and universities each have their own unique missions, serving, attempting to serve their own student populations and working every day to grow in dynamic and creative ways to meet the times in which we all live while preparing their students to both navigate and shape a stronger and sustainable Nevada. Our students' academic success represents this future Nevada. Yet the state's public investment of $1 billion, which has been a consistent, important priority of this legislature, has remarkably ranked 16th nationally in per pupil spending, has also consistently translated to 46th nationally in college attainment outcomes when we look at what has been accomplished with that generous investment by this legislature. Nevada can do better. Fortunately, with SJR 7, the legislature understands this call to action, and in particular, that strong governance drives improved transparency and accountability. Nevada has been one of the fastest growing, if not the fastest, states in population growth the last many decades. Our learning institutions have added student numbers, increased diversity, and have responded to their local economies to understand the types of workforce their local communities need to aid our growing economies. However, the governance structure of our higher education system is struggling to be able to respond to those opportunities our institutions need in changing times. Oftentimes, divisive board regionalism wins the day over politics of a new, unified, sustainable Nevada at the expense of the institutions they govern. The Board of Regents continue to come under the microscope for various and ongoing fiscal management and general information issues the public and you, the legislature, continually question and are forced to answer questions either in hearings like this, in outside queries, or through the media. More simply, they consistently are struggling to challenge and keep up with the business, academic, and people largesse of their own billion dollar organization. Change is hard, even when you know you need it, and change management principles will say the most organizations have difficulty reforming chronic legacy issues from the inside. By placing the Board of Regents in the governance of the Nevada Legislature, SJR 7 will enable greater accountability and transparency of the existing Board of Regents and ensure stronger stewardship of the valuable taxpayer dollars currently invested in the NSHE system. The public trust deserves stronger governance, and with it, with this change, the public trust will increase in the system that so many families and students depend on for their higher education experience and what Nevada desperately depends on for our future economic sustainability and growth. By placing the existing Board of Regent governance structure in the purview of the Nevada legislature, it's not perfect. No solution would ever be. No public governing institution ever is. However, this change does create increased accountability and transparency than does exist today in the current system for Nevadans to understand how current funds are spent and how the board is making decisions on behalf of its institutions and students. It's important to note, as has been said, this change implements checks and balances without changing the current regent governance structure itself which already has itself proven itself as expensive and unmanageable. Moreover, it will bring the important focus back to students and our economy. The increased transparency and accountability will be a positive step for NT as well. All parties, the public, the students, the legislature, and NT stand to benefit from this change. I want to thank again the committee for hearing this critical bill and for increased transparency, accountability, and performance of all Nevada's higher education system. We are due to pass SGR 7. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schaefer. And now I have former State Senator Warren Hardy of Hardy Strategies. Good evening. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chair Arnshaw, members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. And thank you for taking the time to, to um, hear this important issue. Uh, what we're really, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do here in my mind, sorry, that's my son, I'll call him back. Um, uh, what we're trying to do here today is, is, is return to what we believe is the original ten, intent of the framers of the Constitution. Um, if you take the time, and I'm not a lawyer, and I'm, cert I'm, not a, I'm certainly not a constitutional historian, but if you take the time to read the, the, the history and the minutes and documents from the 1864 Constitutional uh, Convention on this particular subject, uh, it becomes very, very clear very, very quickly but that what the founders intended in giving some a constitutional authority to the Board of Regents was directly related to the Morrill Moral Act, Moral Act, which was passed in, in 1862. It's also abundantly clear based on the, those, the, uh, the public record from those debates that the legislature fully intended to the, for the legislature to have significant oversight. In fact, one of the proponents of uh, the legislature in that uh, conversation spoke specifically about not wanting the Board of Regents to, to think they have more power than they do. And so it's pretty clear, in my mind, and pretty hard to argue that the founders intended for the legislature to have significant uh, oversight and not to create a fourth branch of government. Again, as, as Assemblyman Roberts said, those, those constitutional powers that were granted uh, were, were related to them being able to access the Morrell moral Fund Acts uh, um, at, that at that time. And unfortunately, in 1948, there was a Supreme Court ruling that caused some confusion about this. And in 1948, the Supreme Court ruled that there is some, there is some limit on the legislature's authority over the Board of Regents. Uh, but that ruling was very limited, very specific. And unfortunately, since that time, the Board of Regents has taken that argument and sort of evolved it into this notion, as they argued, I think it was in 1981, that they have a unique constitutional status uh, that provides virtual uh, autonomy and, and thus immunity from legislative actions or certain legislative actions. That is entirely inconsistent. I, I would argue the Supreme Court ruling of in 1948 was inconsistent with what the founders intended. But that, that argument that was used in 1981 to say that they have a unique constitutional status and therefore immunity from legislative action in certain cases is exactly the opposite of what the founders intended. Um, so, so, Mr. Chair, as a result of, of tradition, as a result of circumstances, we've essentially created since 1948, we've essentially created a system of, where, of government where we have another branch of government, which is the which is the Board of Regents. The problem with that, and I do know enough about the Constitution to know this, that the, if you're going to have a branch of government in the Constitution, there's got to be checks and balances. That's a fundamental reality of our constitutional form of government. That clearly does not exist for this, this um, inadvertent fourth branch of government that we've created. So what this bill does, I believe, is goes back to the voters, ask them to reconsider this question uh, and, and, uh, and have an opportunity to, to understand it. And that's key point to the why, because I know the first question that's gonna come is why are we, why are we re revisiting the public's already voted on it? Well, in our post election voting and, 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 and analysis of the, of the ballot, it's interesting to know there is just significant, not only polling, but uh, um, statistical evidence that the voters did not understand this question. A full 60,000 fewer voters voted on question two, on question one, then voted on question two. They did not understand the question. And so that, that, a lot of that blame uh, goes to us for not being clear enough on what it was we intended and what we wanted to, to, to have asked. Um, that this legislation and this, this resolution, excuse me, is specifically intended to come up with a, a a much clearer ballot initiative so the public can understand what we're trying to do. And I think my colleagues have pretty artic pretty well articulated what it doesn't do. It's not our intent. We, I, I'm unaware of anybody that has had any conversations about changing the current status in the context of this, of this statute. 
or this resolution. Uh, we simply think the founding fathers of the state of Nevada intended for the legislature to have significant impact. Uh, I would even go as far, and it's just my opinion, but I would even uh, even go as far as to say, uh, but for the Morale Act uh, a, a dynamic, they probably wouldn't have provided that kind of, that, that's how clear the record is in my mind that the founders intended the legislature to treat the Board of Regents like every other state agency. So uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll stand down and uh, attempt to answer any questions and thank you for the time. Thank you very much, Senator Hardy. Appreciate your input on this proposed constitutional amendment. Members, any questions uh, for Senator Dondero Loop or Ms. Schaefer or Senator Hardy? Question. Senator Sievers, cancer. Senator Sievers, cancer, I cannot hear you. I think your mute might still be on. Uh, oh, oh, thank you. Um, so, uh, thank you, Chair Ornshaw. So I was looking at the provisions around the auditing, which is under Section 42. Why you're putting that in the Constitution? Because I, th I think the legislative legislature has that type of authority anyway, is to do audits or reviews or whatever they want to. So I wasn't sure why you were you were adding that um, in the Constitution. Thank you, Chair Ornshaw. That's a, that's a good question. Um, part of the reason is based on our public outreach and our polling that this is something that we believe the public clearly wanted to see in the, in the statute. Uh, there, was, there was no question on, on uh, the feedback we got that they wanted to see an audit of the system in the Constitution. So that, that's the reason we included it. Thank you, Senator Hardy. Senator Sievers, cancer, any follow-up? Um, I don't have any follow-up questions at this time, thank you. Thank you. Members, any additional questions for the sponsor, or Senator Hardy or Ms. Schaefer? You know, uh, Chair Angel, I do. I do have a comment. I don't know if you want to take a comment. Please go ahead. <laughs> question. So, um, I'm I'm fairly familiar with the system of higher ed, and I and I think there's there's narratives out there that aren't necessarily accurate, and I I think it's important to recognize that both both four year institutions, UNR and UNLV, are um, tier they're tier one U.S. News and World Report, but they're also R one, which is high research, and so it's kind of amazing for a small state like ours have the level of education available for, for our students. And also, I think it's important to recognize that they, um, when you look at University of Nevada, Reno, the graduation rates, uh, or graduation rates currently like 61 or 62 percent, which is above average for a, a, a public school. So I think we need to recognize how hard the institutions are working to educate um, our, our students. And I also want to recognize the community colleges because they partner so frequently with the private sector to try to make sure that they're providing the workforce that's needed. And there's definitely room for improvement because it's a moving target as we've experienced um, with COVID-19, right? So some of the jobs that existed aren't going to exist anymore and they have to be key partners with the private sector. So I, I, I feel like um, they, they have become a target for, for negative comments and I think that they're doing a, a you know an, ama an amazing job, and I do hope that we can continue to support them because we need to raise the bar, the education bar in the state, um, because that's how we're going to have a stronger, more resilient economy. So I'm not that isn't related to this um, the, the measure that's before us, but I do think that there's this narrative that's out there that the the schools are underperforming, but we're not. I mean, the, the, the schools for the state of Nevada have done a really great job, but the, the community colleges or Nevada State College or GRI, which is renowned, um, you know, ac across the world. So I just wanted to add that comment and then we can continue. Thank you. Mr. Chair, may I? May well, I, I do appreciate that comment. Thank you. Um, obviously, some great things are happening over uh, at our university or community college. Mr. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Mr. All the front of the center. I, I was just going to make a quick comment because I so appreciate what Senator Sievers Gansard is saying. Um, and I don't think anybody has any question about how hard our universities are working and the great job that they're doing um, on both ends of the state and in every other community college. I think that um, we have some really great things going on and I don't think this um, addresses that. I don't think anybody's questioning that. Um, I think that um, the question is, is that the system has been put into the Constitution. So 
Um, that's unlike any other board that we have. So, um, but I do appreciate your comments because I agree with you how hard the university is working. And I will defer to uh, Mr. Hardy. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I just want—I just want to do the same thing. I just sort of want to associate myself with uh, Senator Gansard's comments because I, I think it's remarkable, and it's something that everybody in Nevada be, ought to be proud of that we have two top-tier research universities in Nevada. That, that's really remarkable. And and I, I recently learned that, uh, and I think this is accurate, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Maureen, but I recently lear learned that each of our graduates in our first year graduating class of the medical school matched uh, at, 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 at top, top-tier schools for their, for their um, uh, residencies. That, that's remarkable in terms of what you're talking about, Senator Ganser, that the people that we have are so talented and doing such a, a wonderful job. So I would associate myself with those comments, and I, and I don't want anything to be here to be um, uh, conceived or cons considered that we don't, we don't believe that. My, my interest in this goes back to 2005 when I was assigned by uh, Senator Reggio to chair a committee on to look at higher education in 2005, and I and I realized uh, this this uh, misunderstanding that I think occurred uh, uh, relative to a little too much constitutional power and uh, perceived constitutional power, and so this is just an effort to correct that and get the legislature back to where the founders intended it to be with their input. So thank you, Senator, and I agree with you completely. Thank you very much. And I, I know the majority leader and I are both very proud that uh, William S. Boyd Law School has moved up to 60th in the U.S. News and World Report uh, rankings of law schools around the country. And we're very proud of, of all the hard work uh, that our, our uh, former professors are doing down there at uh, UNLV. All right. If I don't see any other questions from members. Oh, so Vice Chair Lang. Um, I'm sorry, I had to step out for a moment, but I got an email about an amendment. Did you talk about an amendment to this? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Warren Hardy, is that uh, from the Nevada Faculty Alliance? Yes. Could you speak to that? Yes, we have seen, and I don't want to interrupt Senator Lou, but but we we have seen that amendment. The problem with that amendment is that it goes in the opposite direction in terms of what we're trying to accomplish by um, by uh, clarifying this language. It makes it far more complicated. When we took an amendment last time, it put in language about oh, I can't remember the language now, but it was. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, uh, what was it, Maureen, if you can help me, academic? Uh, uh, land grant language, there was academic uh, freedom. Academic freedom. And, and concepts, but again, confusing to uh, voters. There was just lots of concepts being addressed. And, and so the, the reason we don't consider that a friendly amendment at this point is not because it doesn't have merit. Uh, I think we trust the legislature. Um, and, and, and frankly, the Enchi to, to, to work through those kinds of issues. Um, and we don't want to further confuse the issue in a session where we're trying to simplify the issue. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Senator Hardy. I appreciate that. I just, um, you know, just came through in my email and I just wanted to make sure whether you were going to accept it or not so I could consider that when we're talking about this. Thank you. And thank you, Senator. Very much, Vice Chair Lang. Any additional questions, members? All right, we'll now go to support uh, broadcasting. Uh, if there's anyone in the queue who'd like to speak in support of Senate Joint Resolution 7, the proposed constitutional amendment, we're allotting two minutes per caller. To testify in support of Senate, Gen Gen Senate Joint Resolution number seven, please press star nine now to get your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 298. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Once again, caller with the last three digits, 298. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. 
Apologies. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Gina Bon Jovi, B-O-N-G-I-O-V-I, -I, Managing Partner of Bon Jovi Law Firm and Chair of the Board of Trustees for the Vegas Chamber. On behalf of the state's largest and broadest based business association, the Vegas Chamber is in support of SJR 7 and appreciates the work that the bill sponsors have done to bring this proposal forward today. As committee members know and has been discussed, the Vegas Chamber has a long track record of engaging on higher education matters because workforce development is a major concern of employers and our members. The Chamber believes that the passage of SJR 7 is an important component to reforming the state's higher education governance structure and aligning it to meet the needs of today's students and employers. We all recognize that the demands on our workforce are quickly changing, and we need to revisit how our higher education structure is responding to these changes. Nevada's employers need students who are ready to enter the workforce when they graduate from an institution of higher education. Additionally, our economy needs innovations through research that can drive diversification. This is why the Vegas Chamber has a long and consistent history of supporting higher education reform initiatives in our state. And it is for that reason that the Vegas Chamber is supporting SJR 7. Governance reform has been an ongoing discussion in this building for many years, and the need to fix our governance structure persists and should be addressed. And we recognize, as was stated previously, that the language of AJR 5 that eventually became ballot question one was confusing to voters this past November. SJR 7 would provide much needed clarity between the Board of Regents and the state legislature, while at the same time enact governance reforms that many in our state are seeking. We do recognize there have been recent efforts by NC to align education, but for the long-term benefits of both students and employers, we need a reformed higher education governance structure we can depend on for the long term. This is good public policy that is based on sound reasoning, data, and facts. We urge this body to pass SJR 7. I would like to thank the chair and the members of the committee for the opportunity to speak today. Caller with the last three digits, 633. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. My name is Peter Grema, P-E-T-E-R-G-R-E-M-A. I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and a legislative intern with Senator Dallas Harris. I'm calling in support of SJR 7. This constitutional amendment is needed to ensure that the Nevada system of higher education and University Board of Regents are held accountable and that there is transparency and oversight over higher education in our state. The Board of Regents should be removed from the, from the Nevada Constitution. There should be no ambiguity that they are a fourth branch of government and they should answer to the legislature. I'd just like to echo the comments that others before me have already made. And she's the third largest line item in the Nevada state budget, yet it lacks sufficient oversight. And there have been numerous controversies regarding regions and the system as a whole. The regents, and by extension, ENCHI, hide behind their constitutional status in order to skirt proper oversight. I did some research on the Board of Regents and have compiled a list of over 120 news articles over the past five years detailing controversies and problems with the board, former chancellors, and their treatment of certain institutions in the state. When there is this much negative media coverage towards a certain subject, it is indicative of a much larger issue. It is, disheart it is disheartening to hear that a common sense issue such as updating the constitutionality of a board to the needs of a 21st century Nevada is turned into a regional fight. You will hear this when hearing opposing testimony towards SJR 7. I'd just like to say that what is right for Southern Nevada is right for the state as a whole, and removing the Board of Regents from the Constitution is the right move for all Nevadans. Thank you for your time. Caller with the last three digits, 698. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good evening. Good evening to Chair Orange Shaw on the committee. For the record, my name is Olivia Chechi, first name O-L-I-V-I-A, last name C-H-E-C-H-E, -C -H -E, and I am a political science and public policy student at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I also serve as the Senate President for CSUN Student Government, and today I strongly urge your support of SJR 7 because it will give students like me a stronger voice in our future. In my past three years of being a UNLV student, I have seen how a lack of transparency and accountability has furthered distrust in our higher education governance. I've seen students hurt by the implementation of student surcharges during a global pandemic, unprofessional behavior from elected regents, and reprehensible statements on public record that went unchecked until there was public outrage drawing attention to the situation. 
However, this movement isn't about an individual or individual actions. This is about a broken system that has allowed all of these things to happen in the first place, even though our students deserve better. As Nevada's higher education institutions continue to grow, it is crucial for us to look ahead, not back, and help our students become better prepared to enter the workforce. Last November, ballot question one narrowly lost by 3,877 votes, or approximately a 0.3% margin. The tally on question one was extremely close, and I firmly believe that Nevada voters would have supported the measure had it not been for the confusing language, as shown by the over 59,000 voters who voted for question two, but not question one. Now is not the time to give up on progress. Here we have an opportunity to give voters another say in how their public dollars are spent on higher education and how we can improve educational outcomes for students like me. As someone who is really connected to their university, I can assure you that some of the folks most impacted by the subject matter were and are on board. I'm hungry for positive change, and I know I'm not the only student who feels this way. Your support of SJR 7 can give Nevadans another chance to vote on this important policy issue as we seek to modernize our higher education governance and help students along the way. Thank you so much for your time. Caller with the last three digits, 722. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Once again, caller with the last three digits, 722. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. My name is Vanessa Booth, B-A-N-E-S-S-A-B-O-O-T-H for the record. Good afternoon, Chair and the Senate Committee on Legislative Operations and Elections. My name is Vanessa Booth and I am a public policy and political science major at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I also serve as a CSUN Senator and as the current news editor for the UNLV Scarlet and Gracie Press. Today, I am here to testify not on behalf of my affiliations, but instead on behalf of the several thousands of students who attend UNLV every semester and feel as if they have been overspoken for far too long. The Nevada system of higher education has the potential to grow as an institution only if we allow modernization and reform to occur to promote more inclusivity within our Madisonian system. Today, I'm here to strongly urge you all to vote in support of SJR 7. As a student at UNLV who was avid about the passing of ballot question one, I remember several times throughout last fall, speaking to family members and friends about the ballot initiative, but learning that they were confused about the wording of the bill and felt that they made an uninformed decision and regretted their initial vote after learning it didn't pass. Many today will try to argue in opposition, stating that it did not pass because it wasn't supported. However, I strongly urge this committee to not strip the rights of voters in Nevada. Ballot question one failed by the smallest margin possible. As public servants, we must actively fight to educate our constituents on understanding the difficult legal jargon that comes along with these ballot initiatives. And that's why I strongly believe SJR 7 should be passed to give voters a second chance that they deserve. By passing SJR 7, we will be ensuring our federal dollars go back to the classroom to support students like me and will modernize how we govern higher education. The last time our higher education governance structure was reformed was around 1864. The fact that our governing system hasn't been reformed or modernized at all severely concerns me as a political science major, given that there isn't an updated system of checks and balances within NG. Accountability, transparency, and oversight are key to a thriving system. I encourage you all to support SJR 7. It's time for modernization, adaptation, and for entities to join other states in thriving through adapting to the needs of their state and students. Thank you, I yield. Caller with the last three digits, 796. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and maybe get. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Rusty McAllister, R U S T Y M C A L L I S T E R. <coughs> And I am the Executive Secretary Treasurer of the Nevada State AFL-CIO. And on behalf of our 150,000 plus members here in the state of Nevada, we are in support of Senate Joint Resolution Number 7. Uh, it's been a long day, Mr. Chairman, and I won't be little, uh, or I won't be, uh, take up a lot of your time. Uh, we believe that the increased accountability and transparency is a good thing. You know, by allowing governance to remain in place, but with greater oversight, the system for higher education will still be able to function and we'll all be better off for it. 
Uh, we believe that this measure is a, a, a common sense measure uh, uh, for accountability and transparency. And for those reasons, Mr. Chairman, and all the other points that have been brought up before, we are in support of this legislation. Chair, that concludes testimony in support of Senate Joint Resolution Number 7. Thank you very much. Uh, broadcasting, if there's anyone in the queue who'd like to speak in opposition to the measure, we're allotting two minutes per caller. To testify in opposition of Senate Joint Resolution Number 7, please press star 9 now to get your place in the queue. Two minutes. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You may begin. Thank you. This is Kent Irvin, E R V I N, for the Nevada Faculty Alliance, the Association of Faculty at NC Colleges and Universities. We are testifying in opposition in order to propose an alternative, which is on Nellis as a conceptual amendment to SJR 7. The NFA appreciates the intent to reform the Nevada system of higher education and its relationships with the legislature and increase accountability, but we believe there are better ways to accomplish that and to clarify the intent to, voter, to voters. Our amendment broadens the constitutional language establishing the state university to include all departments appropriate for modern institutions of higher education. It makes explicit the authority for future legislatures to create institutions of higher education separate from the state university. The Board of Regents is retained in the Constitution, but the amendment clarifies that the board is part of the executive branch explicitly and that its governing duties are prescribed by law, the original intent, but it removes the control and management language. Recognizing the resistance of voters to relinquish their right to elect regents, it retains elected regents as a majority of the board that allows additional regents to be appointed. Very importantly, the amendment adds protection of academic freedom for the faculty from political meddling in academic matters, and that's from either the legislature or, the, or a board of regents. A letter from AAUP on Nellis explains academic freedom, as does one of our whereas clauses. Those clauses are modified in the amendment to focus on and to clarify the intent of the constitutional provisions being amended rather than past history. We truly believe these changes would better implement the stated goals of the proponents of SJR 7 while not leaving voters so confused about what will happen if the Board of Regents is removed from the Constitution entirely. The primary point of confusion on question one was being told it would not change the election of the regents while the amendment removed the election of the regents. Please look at the constitutional language on pages three and four of the amendment and read the, read the new whereas clauses for explanations. We're ready to work with the sponsors to implement these improvements to SJR 7, and I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Caller with the last three digits, 010, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Thank you. My name's Jake Tibbetts. That's J-A-K-E-T-I-B-B-I-T-T-S, and I'm the Eureka County Natural Resources Manager, speaking on behalf of Eureka County today. So Chair Orenshaw and members of the committee, thank you for allowing Eureka County to provide our opinion and insights on SJR 7. Eureka County is opposed to SJR 7. We note that question one, based on AJR 5, which proposed to effectively do the same thing, was resoundingly rejected by Eureka County voters with over 76% voting against it. This large margin in Eureka County is not due to folks not understanding the question. Beyond arguing about the merits of moving the Board of Regents under direct control of the legislature, we are primarily concerned with and opposed to the provision on line 13 and 14 of page five, proposing to amend section four of the Nevada Constitution by adding the open-ended power of the legislature to designate additional, quote, other departments deemed appropriate for the state university, end quote. We believe this language is overreach and muddies the waters related to land grant status by including yet to be identified or defined, quote, additional, end quote, departments. 
This isn't consistent with the original land grant intent and the land grant mission. Please, at a minimum, strike this language from SJR 7 if the committee chooses to move SJR 7 forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Three digits, five seven seven. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Chris Bailey, Nevada State Education Association, the voice of Nevada educators for over 120 years. NSCA opposes SJR 7 to remove constitutional provisions governing the election and duties of the Board of Regents. Nevadans made their voices heard when they voted down question one. Voters support electing members of Nevada's Board of Regents. While NSC did not actively engage in the question one campaign, we have a longstanding position in support of electing governing boards in education. Elected boards are in place to ensure schools and colleges reflect the values of the people, providing direct lines of accountability to the community. This is the main reason elected boards are preferable to appointed or hybrid models. Appointed officials are shielded by an appointing authority who is typically significant other responsibilities in addition to board appointments. It's extremely rare to see an elected official voted out of office over the actions or conduct of another official they have appointed. This is truer still when the appointment is made by another deliberative body. Look, democracy can be messy. Money can have a substantial influence on elections and sometimes campaigns are negative and turn off voters. Oftentimes our preferred candidates do not win. While these challenges are real, there's certainly not enough to abandon our system of democratic governance. Instead, we should continue our efforts to make elections more democratic. NSCA supports the direction of expanding democracy, and we will continue our commitment to engage in increasing electoral participation and education. Listen to educators, listen to the voters. Thank you. Caller with the last three digits, 814. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and maybe can. Once again, caller with the last three digits, 814. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and maybe can. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Mark Dubrava. That's M-A-R-K-D-O-U-B-R-A-V-A. -A. I am an elected regent from District 7 in Las Vegas, and I am the current chair of the Nevada Board of Regents. I'm here today to testify in opposition to SJR 7. At the outset, I would like to reaffirm the respect the Board of Regents has towards this committee and the entire Nevada legislature. The board is ready and willing to continue working and collaborating with the legislature on the important challenges facing higher education. As this committee is aware, the very issues now presented by SJR 7 were debated and discussed by the legislature for nearly four years and ultimately became question one on last year's ballot. The constitutional amendments presented by question one sought to change 156 years of Nevada history. The people of Nevada rejected those changes. This occurred only four months ago. Our democracy mandates that the collective wisdom of the voters be respected. Over the past few years, our two major universities have achieved R1 Carnegie research status. We have two thriving medical schools in Southern and Northern Nevada. We have a top tier law school and a nationally renowned research institute. SJR7 does nothing to improve higher education in Nevada. It does nothing to advance research. It does nothing to improve workforce development or our communities. Most importantly, it does nothing to help students. The delivery of instruction, the growth of campuses, and the retention of top faculty. Rather, this measure creates a cloud of uncertainty, significantly lowers the morale of our faculty and staff, and impedes our short and long-term strategic goals and planning. It is, in short, a significant distraction from our core mission. On behalf of the Board of Regents, I respectfully urge this committee to reconsider repeating this effort and turn a new chapter. Our new leaders are willing to work with the legislature to advance common sense reform that will address the concerns of the past and make way for the future. This bill is unnecessarily divisive at a time when, more than ever, we need to work together. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today.
caller with the last three digits, 043. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Caller, you are unmuted and may begin. Caller 043, you are unmuted and may begin. Caller with the last three digits, 043. If you are having trouble, please press star six to unmute yourself and you may begin. Chair, it appears there are no more callers in opposition of Senate Joint Resolution Number 7. Thank you very much, Broadcasting. Uh, can we now go to neutral? Anyone who wants to uh, speak neutral to the proposed constitutional amendment, we're allotting two minutes per caller. To testify in the neutral position on Senate Joint Resolution Number 7, please press star 9 now to get your place in the queue. three digits, 043. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hello. Uh, my name is Asim Iskand of the Second Benjaloon. That's B-E-N-J-E-L-L-O-U-N. Uh, my apologies. I seem to have been lost in the queue. May I give a comment in favor of SG07? Yes, that's okay. I will... Uh, Thank you very much. So yeah, uh, good evening, good afternoon, Chair Owen Shaw and the committee. Uh, I'm the, my name is Nassim. I'm the Attorney General for the University of Nevada, Las Vegas Student Government. I'm here to testify on behalf of my constituents and fellow students in favor of SGO 7 as a non-traditional student, someone who came to this university at the age of 15. I spent the last two years unable to directly influence my system of higher education through the ballot box. But I'm the, not the only individual who's robbed of a chance to express such influence. Due to the ambiguous and inaccessible language of age of five, many had cast their ballots without being able to discern the true effect of their vote. I urge this committee to pass this bill and to grant Nevadans the right and opportunity to express their opinion on this matter again. It's time that we look forward and do what is right. It's time we modernize our higher education and create a system of equity, accountability, and transparency. Again, I thank you for letting me give my public comment at this time. My apologies for the technical difficulties. I yield. Caller with the last three digits, 312. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hello, I am Joshua Padilla, J O S H U A P A D I L L A. I also got lost in the queue, so I will be giving comment and support as well. Um, I am the CSUN Student Government President. I am Latino, born and raised here in Las Vegas, and I am in my fourth year of civil engineering. I'm here to strongly urge your support for SJR 7. As we saw in the last election, the language of AGR 5 narrow, narrowly failed, which has extremely, excuse me, in the last, length, the last election, the language of AGR 5 narrowly failed, uh, which has language extremely similar to SJR 7. That was due to the complicated and hard to understand question language itself. According to, according to Ballotpedia, there were 626,146 votes for yes and 630,023 votes for no, meaning it only failed by 3,877 votes, which is about a margin of 0.3%. Clarifying the language and making it much easier for people, seeing as this was the biggest issue voters face when trying to understand the measure, would definitely see a huge difference in the final voting numbers. As a concerned UNLV student, it is time for more transparency and accountability to take place within ENCHI. Everyone knows the history of ENCHI and the very large lack of public trust. From questionable conduct to questionable decisions to questionable comments, a simple Google search of ENCHI public trust 
shows many articles talking about these things, and I'm sure everyone here is informed on some of these examples. Students are tired of the questionable behavior. Increased transparency and accountability will help everyone involved, and she, the public, students. As someone who talks to many students, students are ready for positive change, and you can see that from many of the students that have called in today and are going to call in in the future. This is a large opportunity to give voters another shot to change a system that has proven to be in dire need of transparency and accountability. Give voters another shot to make a positive change that will help our entire state. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to the future. Chair, there appears to be no testimony in the neutral position at this time. Thank you, Broadcasting. And, you know, we've had some technical difficulties with this meeting. Would you be able to check all of the cues, support, opposed, neutral, just to make sure that waiting to speak who somehow got lost or, or is having technical difficulties? If you wish to testify in the neutral or in the in support of Senate Joint Resolution Number 7, Please press star nine now to get your place in the queue. Chair, we have no callers at this time in support. Thank you very much, Broadcasting. and. Can you check and make sure there's no one else in any of the other queues support opposition just to be safe? To testify in opposition of Senate Joint Resolution Number 7, please press star 9 now to get your place in the queue. Chair, there appears to be no testimony at this time in opposition. Thank you, and could you check the support queue too, just to make sure nobody's waiting? To testify in the neutral position, Senate Joint Resolution, please press star nine now to get your place in the queue. Chair, there appears to be no testimony in the neutral position at this time. Thank you very much, Broadcasting. Senator Dondero, Loop, appreciate your presenting the bill. Any closing comments you or Ms. Schaefer, Senator Hardy would like to make? I uh, know, uh, Chair Orangell, I wanna thank the committee. I know it's been a, a late day, and so I really appreciate you listening and your good questions, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Dondero, Loop. We'll now close the hearing on Senate Joint Resolution 7, and uh, we'll, now we'll open it up for our last item on our agenda, public comment. If you wish to provide public comment, please press star nine now to get your place in the queue. Chair, there appears to be no general public comment at this time. Right, well, um, and again, in light of the technical difficulties, maybe if we could just give that another moment just to make sure there's not anybody trying to get in or having trouble. Yes, Chair. Thank you, Broadcasting. Thank you, members. Broadcasting, just wondered if you could check one more time. To give general public comment, please press star nine now to get your place in the queue. Chair, the line is up and working. However, the lobby is empty at this time. 
Thank you very much, Broadcasting. Thank you, members. Uh, thank you to our, our staff, our Legislative Council, and all the presenters. And we are adjourned.